side has grown and this side has shrunk. <laughs> it's, it's like, that's okay. They don't, they don't appreciate my preaching. That's all right. I can handle that. But <laughs> yeah, God is good and uh, he's good all the time. Amen. Um, we've been journeying through the Gospel of John, and we are at the uh, closure of chapter 6, where Jesus has fed the 5,000. The people came after him and wanted more of the, the bread that he offered. He, he gave his teaching, the discourse on the bread of life, and uh, they didn't understand what he was talking about when he said, I am the bread. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. And so he said in verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And when the crowds heard this, they still did not understand that he was talking about spiritual things. He was bringing spiritual truth. And so he asked them in chapter 6, verse 61, does this offend you? Does this teaching offend you? And uh, of course it did. It did offend you. And that's where we left off. I uh, challenged all of us, you know, with the teachings of Christ. The teachings of Christ are offensive. I remember how deeply offended I was when someone told me that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by him. That was deeply offensive to me, as I believe that all paths lead to the same place. But you know what? The gospel is a stumbling stone, but it's also a rock of stability because it is the truth. And as hard as it is, we have to wrestle with these hard teachings of Christ in order to truly come to that place of trusting him and resting in him. So we're going to pick it up in John chapter 6, beginning in verse 62. We're going to read to the end of the chapter. John chapter 6, it's just 10 verses we're going to look at this morning. So I'll, I'll begin in... in uh, Verse 60, Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word is spirit and manna to our spirit man. We invite your Holy Spirit to come and teach us this morning and have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6, verse 60, therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, does this offend you? We pick it up in verse 62. What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said... Therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. And then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? And one of you is a devil. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. So again, Jesus presented this hard teaching about his his uh, body and his blood and that they would need to eat and drink of his body and his blood. And of course he was speaking spiritually of 
the fact that he would lay down his life on Calvary and his body would be broken, his blood shed, and through his atoning sacrifice and believing in his sacrifice, we can have eternal life. We talked about a false doctrine or teaching that is still very much alive within Christendom today, and that is transubstantiation, the belief that when the priest pronounces a certain blessing over the, the wine and the, the wafer, that it becomes the body of Jesus. This is not true. And so we go on here, and he says uh, in verse 62, What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Jesus is seeing, saying, You find it difficult to believe that I am the bread and the uh, the essential of life which came down from heaven, you will believe it with no problem when you see me ascending into heaven, back into heaven. The resurrection and ascension of Jesus. He was prophesying his resurrection and his ascension at this point. They would be the final claims to his messiahship. Remember, he's bringing his truth to the people. He's revealing himself through his works, through the miracles. And he is teaching and telling them, I am who I say I am. I am the great I am. Unfortunately, many in that crowd, most, the majority, if not all, except for the 12, rejected his claim and turned away. And unfortunately, that is the situation today. Many continue to turn away from Christ, rejecting his claims and refusing the gifts, the blessings of forgiveness and eternal life and wholeness and healing that he offers. Not to mention love joy and peace, peace with our God, peace with ourselves, and peace with our fellow man. You remember the, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who fared sumptuously at his table every day, and there was a beggar that stood at his gates and didn't have a thing. Well, both of them died, and the the beggar whose name was Lazarus was carried to, to Abraham's bosom, the place of comfort and security where uh, in the Old Testament, uh, the believers there were carried to that place. Meanwhile, the rich man was in Hades. And he looked across and he, he, he pleaded to God. He said, God, if it be possible, send, my, send Lazarus. Send someone to tell my brothers, I've got five brothers, tell them to, to repent and turn so that they don't have to come to this place. And the Lord said, it's not possible for that to happen. And he said, they have Moses and the prophets. They have the word of God to tell them about Messiah. Let them read that. He said, no, Lord, but if someone rises from the dead, if you send Lazarus to tell my brothers, they will repent. And he goes, no, if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, even if I, someone rise from the dead, they will not believe. And that is the situation we have today. Even though God sent his only begotten son into the world who lived a sinless life and gave his life for all of humanity. People reject the historical Jesus, the God-man. They reject his claims, even though he has risen from the dead. Verse 63, it is the spirit, spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Jesus reminds us of what he said to Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 6. Flip back there to chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 6. 
As he's speaking to Nicodemus, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. He's speaking about spiritual things. They didn't get it. They said, how can a man enter again into his mother's womb and be born again? He's saying, hey, it's spirit. My words are spirit. And if you hear them, the deeper essence, you will receive life if you believe. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The most important, the all-important thing is the life-giving power of the spirit. The flesh is of no help. No help. We have no capacity to understand the depths of, of God's truth for, with our natural mind. The Bible clearly teaches this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2, beginning in verse 12. I'm going to read through 16. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may know the things that have been freely given to us by God. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, but the natural man does not receive the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things. Yet see, he himself is rightly judged by no one. Verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When you're born again, you have the mind of Christ. And God gives you that ability in that process to be drawn to him. What is the mind of Christ? Wow, I want the mind of Christ more and more and more. Well, you all know the passage in Philippians chapter two, which speaks about the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter two, verse one. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind, let nothing be done, here we go, through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only out for your own interests, but also the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. This is the mind of Christ. And the, we are being sanctified and being uh, conformed into the image of Christ day by day, it says, from glory to glory. Oh, how many times I fail. And my mind is, is just not there. And I say, God. Cleanse me, heal me, draw me, fill me. You see, it's ongoing, you know. The Bible says, be ye kept being filled. In Ephesians, Paul said to the Ephesian believers, don't be drunk with wine, but be ye kept being filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, when we ask for God and more of God, guess what? He will deliver the goods. God has the goods, and he will deliver the goods. And we need him day in and day out. Oh, how I would like to have more of Jesus in my life, that I would look out more for others than I do for myself. You see, basically, I'm a selfish person. It's true. And we all are. We're all, you know, at that core humanity. And God wants to take us to higher places than our humanity can take us, than our own understanding can take us. He wants us to come with him on this journey. Hallelujah. 
if I said to the believers in Rome, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove what is that good and perfect will of God. Hallelujah. God is with us. He's for us. And he, he wants us to cry out to him. Verse 64, but there are some of you who do not believe, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. Boy, this passage in chapter 6 is accentuating, underlining, highlighting the fact that God is omniscient. This is who he is. God is omniscient. He's omnipotent and he's omnipresent. These are things that we can't understand with our human mind. He knows everything. The Bible says that all is naked and open between, before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. God is omniscient. He said the same thing in verses 37 and 44. Oh, I'm sorry. Skip the spot. Ah. The omniscience of God. Supernatural knowing. He knows the beginning from the ending. Jesus knew the hearts of those who professed faith in him. They were saying, yeah, yeah, Lord, we, we believe in you. We want, uh, more, want more of those, uh, uh, br more of that bread. Uh, could you make it uh, uh, whole wheat this time? They were not sincerely believing in his deity and his messiahship. And so he did not commit himself fully to them. Turn back with me to John chapter 2, verse 23. We see that same phenomena happening where there's people following, but they are not really believing fully. They're maybe tasting the power of God through Christ and what he's doing, but they have not yielded to him. And so in John chapter 2, verse 23, it says, Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. They looked at the miracles and wondered about who this guy was. But it says there, Verse 24, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man because he knew what was in man. These folks were, were saying, yeah, yeah, rah, rah, rah. You know, we believe in you, Jesus. But it was not genuine faith. First Peter chapter 2 Verses 7 and 8 tells us, 1 Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, verse 7, therefore to you who believe, this is genuine faith, he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstones and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the world, word to which they were appointed. The passage goes on, but there were some... Verse 64, there are some of you, I'm sorry, verse 65, and he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been grant, granted to him by my father. He said the very same thing in verses 37 and 44. No one can come to me unless it is granted to him by the father. Genuine faith is never exclusively a matter of human decision. 
In the face of unbelief, Jesus reiterated God's sovereignty involved with salvation. And again, we have the divine tension. You know, we have the divine tension in the word of God that challenges us to make a decision. It's a personal decision. We must yield ourselves. And yet, it is impossible unless God draws a person. It's a mystery. And we struggle with this teaching. And we struggle with it in a good way. In a good way. I, I think a good way to struggle with this is to take all of those affirmations and positive words from God where he tells us very clearly that we are saved. And then also to take all those very clear pl places of exhortation to walk a holy life, to surrender completely and to yield to God so that we can be transformed. So you see, it's a divine tension. Hallelujah. And in God's perfect timing and in, in all eternity, you know, those, those things are going to be completely resolved in our own heart and mind and spirit. There's so much about God that I don't understand. But like Billy Graham's team member, Grady Wilson, he says, there's so much, so little that I understand about God, but the little that I do I, has changed my life. It's changed my life. Hallelujah. From that time, many of this, his disciples turned back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Think about it. The 12 had journeyed with him from the beginning and rise of his ministry to the critical place where they found themselves right at that moment. They had witnessed large numbers coming to Christ for baptism in the Jordan River in chapter 4. Multitudes more being fed miraculously with the loaves and the fishes. The paralytic man healed in Jerusalem. They witnessed all of that. And as Jesus prophesied in his discourse on the bread, he foretold his impending death. The bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. Jesus was heading for disaster in human terms. And all could see clearly the direction he was going. It was not possible for him to challenge the Jewish religious authorities as Jesus did and get away with it. There was a social structure there, and those guys held the hammer. They were all like the religious leaders, all those followers. They were looking for a conquering Messiah. We ask ourselves, how could the Jewish nation miss their Messiah? They were looking for a conquering Messiah, one who would put all civil strife to rest, kick these Romans out of the, the territory, and be their king. They were certainly not looking for a suffering Messiah and not a dead one. In fact, today, the rabbis still teach that there are two messiahs they can't they can't reconcile the suffering messiah with the victorious messiah they say it's not possible but we know that jesus christ is the messiah that he came as the suffering servant to die a humble death a humiliating death on the cross for us for me for you and to die 
there and to be buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead. And 40 days, he was on the earth teaching about the kingdom of God. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father. And we know that when he returns, he will be the conquering Messiah. He will be the victorious Messiah. He will not be riding on the humble donkey. He will be riding on a white horse. And his name will be written upon him, the word of God. And judgment will come to this earth. Thank God we don't have to fear that time. We can look forward with great anticipation, knowing that he is going to snatch us up and we will go to be with him in the air. And then we will return with him when he comes to rule and reign and to set up his messianic kingdom where righteousness, justice, and loving kindness will prevail. Oh, how we want that now. We see, see, see the world beginning to shake and to quiver and, and we understand that no human government will ever bring complete peace to the earth. Praise God. We don't have to wait till then, till he sets up his government. The Bible says that, that the government rests upon his shoulders. You know, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. And, and the, the Prince of Peace and, and the, the ruling, the ruling the, his rule will never end. Let me submit to you, his rule begins when we surrender our hearts to him and invite him to come and be the Lord of our lives, to rule and reign in our lives. That even in the midst of all of the, the stuff that we see coming down, and there's more to come, that we don't have to fear. We don't have to tremble in the same sense of those that have no hope. But we can say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Is he sitting on the throne of your heart today? Is he your savior? Is he your Messiah? He came for you. Hallelujah. The fair weather fav followers were getting out while time allowed. He gave them the out. He even gave the 12. He says, hey, you guys want to go? Now's the time. <laughs> you know, those fair weather followers, so to speak, they come to Christ to get something. They come to get something from Jesus, but when, he came, when it came time for them to give something, their very lives, suffering for him, they quit. If we come to him solely to get and we never come to give, we will certainly get uh, turned back too. God calls us to pick up our cross, and he says there's a cost to that discipleship. It's our own personal death. In Mark 8, 34, turn with me to Mark, Gospel of Mark. Chapter 8. All of the synoptic gospels have this call to the cross. Mark chapter 8, verse 34. And when he had called the people to himself with his disciples also, he said to them, Whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Or the, the, another uh, place it says, will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? 
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man also will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. He's coming within the glory of his Father with his holy angels. Are we ashamed of the name of Jesus? I find myself kind of being, getting real quiet sometimes in certain situations. And then the Holy Spirit just kind of says, oh, are you ashamed of me? God, help us to stand up and name the name of Jesus. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we, whereby we must be saved. This earth is headed. The people of this earth are headed for judgment. We have the good news. Your sins can be judged today so that you don't have to fear the future. Hallelujah. You can be forgiven. You can be healed. You can become a child of God. We're praying for Ukraine. We're praying that the believers stand up and in the bomb shelters, in the subways, and in the neighborhoods that they tell the that they tell their neighbors, hey, you know, this is all, you know, this has all got to come down. Jesus is alive and well. You know, to share scripture with those that are trembling, fearful. So Jesus says to his disciples, hey, if you guys want out, now's the time. But Simon Peter, hallelujah, answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter is emerging as the head dog, the main leader of the pack. We've already seen that in the intensity of the storm, when they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee and the storm came up and Jesus came walking on the water, it, it was Peter that said, Lord, if that's you, call me and I will come. This is an intense moment as well. And it called out the loyalty of Peter's heart. Peter says, what? Where, where are we going to go? There's no one else to turn to, Rabbi. We believe that what you say is true, that you speak and you teach the truth. We believe, believe your words and your teaching. And verse 69, also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Messiah. This is the same statement that Peter made at Caesarea, Caesarea Philippi when Jesus asked, who do men say that I am? And, and the disciples said, some think that you're Elijah. Some think that you are John the Baptist risen from the dead. Who do you say that I am? And Peter said the same thing. It was a personal response. It was a personal statement of faith. You are the Christ the Messiah, the Son of the living God. <laughs> and there at uh, Caesarea Philippi, Jesus responded, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, Peter. Who revealed it to him? God did it because he was drawing him. Just as Jesus had stated several times, no one can come to me unless the Father his, who sent me show, draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Jesus reminds them, I chose you. I sovereignly chose you. The word devil means slanderer. False accuser. You know that the devil is slandering you and accusing you before God? He's there day and night saying, look at that no good bum. Look at, look at how he spoke to his wife. Look what he did to his neighbor. Look at. And Jesus says, you know, he's covered. He's covered by me. Yeah, he still carries some of that flesh. But you know. He's yielded to me, and I'm having my way with him. And so back off, you liar. The 
devil is a liar. That's his name. He's a false accuser. He's the father of lies. And we see that in the beginning in Genesis chapter 3. Basically, Jesus is saying, one of you is a devil. The supreme adversary of God operates behind failing human beings. And his malice becomes theirs. In Luke 22, verse 3, Jesus, or, or the Bible tells us that uh, as, as at that last supper, that Satan entered Judas. Luke 22, verse 3. Jesus identifies the source. Satan, that word means adversary, opposer, hostile opponent, enemy. The, the Bible tells us that the devil is like a roaring lion right outside our door, seeking whom he may devour. He's, he's waiting. He's waiting for the opportunity when we're tired and hungry and down to dig at us to make us say things that, that bring him glory, to curse others and to curse the world and all, all of that. That's the enemy of our soul. He's looking to take us down. Hallelujah. That all authority has been given to Christ Jesus. And we can stand in the spirit against the darkest, of attacks. Hallelujah. Put on the full armor of God that you might be able to what? Stand. That you might be able to stand. And what are those two main weapons? The, the, it's all defensive, the armor of God, you know. Uh, the, the, the feet shod with the preparation of gospel. The, the belt of truth about our waist. The breastplate of righteousness. The helmet of salvation. They're all defensive. Picking up the sword of the Spirit. Picking up the Word of God to be able to fight and to stand against the wiles of the enemy and to, to quote Scripture when that darkness comes. And to call upon the name of the Lord, the living God, and ask Him to rebuke this darkness. So Satan is the uh, source of the opposition. He is the opposition. He is the hostile op opponent. Do we see opposition to the gospel message today? What? <laughs> well, come, come with me this afternoon. I'll introduce you to some. Okay. Yes, we see it all around. This opposition, don't be surprised when the opposition comes. That's the thing. Gird yourself up. Expect the opposition. Expect it. Be expecting it and know the source in order to stand and fight effectively with the word of God in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why studying apologetics and uh, Learning how to communicate with people who oppose you in their, their thought and, and belief, it's good. The Bible says that our exercise, our, our, we are exercised in our spirit, man, when we face the opposition. Um, go, go on YouTube and watch, uh, what's the, the brother from New Zealand? Ray Comfort. Go there. Check out Ray Comfort, you know, and uh, just watch, just watch one of his little encounters with people. Yeah, dozens. Oh my goodness, it's so encouraging because same thing's going to happen to us. And how do we respond? It's 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 wonderful exercise. Verse seventy one. He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was he who would betray him, being one of the twelve. This was Judas, the man from Kerioth, a village in Judah, who would be known as the betrayer. Let me just say that your name carries meaning. When, they, when someone mentions your name, they think of you. 
but they think more deeply about you. Your name carries your character and your integrity. Don't sacrifice your integrity. Always stand and speak the truth. Be transparent. Be a person of your word. You know, otherwise you'll be a person that people can't trust. And you will be a reflection of the one you call Lord. Remember, we are ambassadors. We are citizens of a, a different world. We are pointing people to Christ and saying, you know, believe in Jesus and, and uh, be forgiven and, and become his child so that you can live in his kingdom forever. And so, Lord, help us to be those that are truthful, those that our words mean something. We follow through. You are known by your name. You know, my oldest brother passed away into glory two days ago. And he was, uh, he was a good big bro, you know. I have another big bro and, and uh, three others, you know, anyway, six siblings. Oh, man, we, we'd get into fights with some of my brothers. But my big brother, he was the most childlike person, honestly, that I've ever met. And he was loving and kind and generous. And I never saw him ever hold a grudge, judge other people. He was, he was genuine. And so when I remember his name, it's with great uh, clarity. I don't have, there's nothing there to kind of trip it up. You know, he didn't receive the Lord until three years ago. And I thought he had, but he hadn't. And uh, we had some extra time, and I was teaching him to play the ukulele. And, and uh, you know, of course, I was preaching on him and, and sharing the Word of God. We were, we were having a quiet time together every morning, reading the Bible. And at the end of my time there, I said, Bob, have you ever received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? And he said, no. And I said, wow, I, I thought you had. He goes, I go, do you want to do that? And he said, yes, I want to do that. And he was still clear as a bell. And then, uh, you know, he, he went down with Alzheimer's. And, of course, he couldn't remember everything. But I believe that what the Bible teaches is true. And Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you, he who believes in him who sent me has eternal life and shall not come into condemnation, but has passed, has passed from death to life. And so it's with a, a sad heart. We say goodbye to our loved ones, but it's also with great uh, assurance and joy when they say yes to Jesus. Let's be in prayer, not just the nation of Ukraine, but for our families, for our extended families, for our neighbors in these last days. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that your word is powerful, Lord, powerful than any two-edged sword and pierces to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Father, search our hearts this morning. We confess, Father, that our hearts are prone to wander, to turn from you. Father, please have mercy upon us. Bring us back every time. Bring us back to the foot of the cross to remember what Christ has done for us and what you have done through him, Lord. We, we thank you and we give you thanks. We pray, Lord, that you would use us Use us as your emissaries, as your, your, your hands and your feet here upon this earth while we still have the, the time. Lord, use us for your greater glory and purposes, Father. Help us to surrender and yield and to die to our own sinful na nature. Fill us 
with the mind of Christ, your son, to be humble, to be looking out for others and to hold to the truth and speak the truth always in love. Protect us in our integrity and in our character. Help us to make decisions that honor you. Lord, we love you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey. Another, another miracle. It's, it's like uh, nine minutes till 12. Okay. Okay. I was going to start chapter seven, but I'm not going to do that. So uh, if, if you want to track on this time together, meditate on chapter seven this next week. Okay. Yeah. So I will um, pronounce the benediction and, and then uh, the kind. Here's, uh, maybe we'll take Will's call here. Hold on. This is Will Sullivan. Hey, Will, I got you on speakerphone with the church right now. Hi, everybody. Anyway. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Just give a call if you want to go. Okay. Hey, Will, we want to pray for you right now. Uh, right. Yeah, Brother Will is heading to Oahu tomorrow for another surgery. Father, we thank you for our brother. We thank you, Father, for his heart for you. We thank you for his family. We pray, Father, that your peace and your comfort and your presence and your joy would fill both he and Vonda as they prepare to head uh, back over to Oahu. Give them your perfect peace. We pray that you give Will plenty of opportunity to testify of your goodness to his, uh, you know, to the doctors, the surgical team, and the nurses that will be taking care of him. And we pray, Father, that you would lead, guide, and direct them, that this would be a, a successful surgery and that you would uh, exterminate that uh, that infection father in his skull father we pray all of this in the mighty name of jesus amen Thank you. love you brother Hello. aloha mm -hmm. bye <laughs> well, that was timely <laughs> uh just to let you know uh eddie is is recovering and uh keep him in your prayers because that was like a major major deal but i i saw him yesterday and he sends his aloha continue to pray for him all right if you'd stand if you're able to stand you know there's many great uh benedictions In the word of God, I have not memorized this one, so I'm going to read it. This is in Jude. Jude, verse 20. But you, beloved, you know that you're loved by God. He calls you his beloved. Hallelujah. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Hallelujah. God bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.